Hey, good morning, everyone in Mesa, South Mountain, Fountain Hills, and online. We're so glad to be with you today. What you just saw was a little Kingdom Builders update, and it's the time of the year that we talk about Kingdom Builders again. Before I get into my message, I just want to update you on our Kingdom Builders rhythm and what we do. What we are experiencing right now is an incredible season of expansion and growth, and God is the one adding to our number those who are being saved, as Scripture says. Amen. We have been going through an incredible time when a lot of the world has been kind of re re uh, retreating and pulling back. We've We've been seeing God's kingdom advance here at Generation Church, and it's because there's a lot of faithful people in this church who are filled with faith and living for the Lord. Uh, one of the things that we do every year is at the end of the year, we end up giving our Kingdom Builders miracle offering, and we also renew for the following uh, year our Kingdom Builders pledges. And if you're new to Generation Church and you're like, what is Kingdom Builders? That's all of our above and beyond giving above and beyond our tithes and offerings, and we take Kingdom Builders funds and we use it to expand the church of Jesus Christ. So you see building projects, launching new campuses, and we've got all that going on right now. It's to send out missionaries who preach the good news and do outreach in our community here locally, and it's to raise up the next generation of Christian leaders and equip pastors and train them uh, in America and around the world. So what really we got going on here is uh, really, all Christians are called to give tithes and offerings to the Lord, but then the Holy Spirit will lead us individually to be generous and give above and beyond our tithes, and that's what we call kingdom builders here at our church. Now, we're kind of wrapping up a special season uh, right now. In two, uh, 2019, in August, we started what we called the Bold Campaign, and it was a special two-year uh, pledge towards Kingdom Builders to help us build and expand, especially in Mesa, because we got this huge building project going on. It's like a $6 million building project, and we had $2 million pledged, and now we're coming to the end of that two years pledge. So we're wrapping it up here right now. Some people are still giving through the end of the year. And what's really cool, just a little side note, is uh, normally when people pledge to something like that, you could expect like 80% of the pledges to come in. That's kind of like the number. But here we've seen over 100% has come in. And that's been in the middle of a kind of a crazy season. So we've got a lot of things going on. That's just one of the big projects. And so I want to say thank you to everyone who gave as a part of the Bold Campaign. And just let you know, like, that's coming to a close. We're actually going to recognize, like, that's over, okay? That was a special thing. We want to thank you. Now we're kind of getting back into our regular Kingdom Builders rhythm where it's like a yearly pledge, ongoingly. We've got all kinds of things going on. But I just wanted to put it on your radar now so you can start praying about it. Because in November, November 14th, we're going to do our pledge day. We're going to do our miracle offering that day where we give our best gift and uh, that's going to be a day for you as uh, either a follower of Jesus individually or maybe as a married couple to pray now and start praying about how God would lead you to give. Now you might be someone who's already giving to the bold campaign and God might lead you to just keep giving. Some of you ha maybe have told me stories. I I've heard a lot of stories like, you know, we pledged and it was a big stretch, but then we started giving and God just blessed us like crazy and he increased our income and we don't really want to give less now. There's some people who they uh, really sacrificed and they stretched for that season and they need to do less. And that's okay because you're supposed to give whatever God has called you to give. There's some people that would say, like, I can't give anything above my tithes right now. Like, I'm, I'm tight on money. And that's okay as well because giving offerings like this, Kingdom Builders offerings, that's above and beyond. It's as the Holy Spirit leads you. It's an act of generosity, whereas tithing is an act of faithfulness and obedience. Some of you are like, uh, God has blessed me so much that I want to give even more to kingdom builders than I was given before. And I've actually heard a lot of stories where people pledged, they gave to the bold campaign, and then God just did supernatural stuff in their lives. And so really it's based on you and your family, your household, and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Some of you are new to this church. You never heard about this before. But I want you to realize what's going on here. People who came before you have been giving faithfully and generously for years so that when you did come to this church, it would be here for you, ready to serve you and minister to you. 
And the kingdom of God really is a pay it forward economy. Other people gave for you to hear the gospel and be changed by Jesus. And now the Lord calls you to be faithful and generous and sacrifice and give. We're not doing it just for ourselves, although we will benefit personally from a lot of what's going on. But we're doing it for those who don't know Jesus yet, who are still far from God. We want to see other people saved and experience new life in Jesus. I believe other families are going to be changed forever. Other marriages are going to be restored. Other people are going to be set free from addiction and bondage and there's a lot of darkness in this world but God wants to use his church and he wants to use generation church to be a beacon of light into the darkness and he specifically uses you his people so what I'm asking you to do is just pray and just ask God yourself Lord what are you calling me to do what are you calling me to do and when you leave today at all of our campuses we're going to pass out these kingdom builders pledge cards and all I'm asking you to do is just take it home, uh, put it somewhere that you'll see it for these next few weeks, and just have it on your mind, in your heart, to just pray about that. Lord, what are you speaking to me? Not what is Pastor Ryan saying, but what is the Holy Spirit saying? If you will listen to God and do what he says, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. So let's be praying for that, and let's believe for God to do great things. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love my church. Well, we are in a series called Life After Death. And week one, we talked about heaven. Week two, we talked about hell. Last week, we talked about the end times and the return of Christ. Next week, I'm going to talk about the eternal kingdom, heaven, and what it will look like forever, which is different than present day heaven. That's probably, I think, maybe one of the funnest weeks. So make sure you come back next week. Today is going to be a really challenging day for some of you maybe the most challenging sermon you've ever heard but it's also important I want to talk to you today on this subject you will be judged I've got good news and I've got bad news that's it you will be judged it's good news or bad news depending on what kind of judgment you get. I went to a Christian school when I was about 12 years old that was in our church. My dad was the senior pastor of our church in Kansas, and we had a Christian school there. And honestly, I hated it because I was kind of one of those kids that got in trouble a lot, and that school was really strict. So I did lots of pranks and I acted out. One time I, I snuck into the principal's office and I just kind of ransacked the place. By, you know, adult standards, I realized like, it wasn't that bad, but I just like threw papers all over the place and I kind of like, you know, kid version of vandalized it because I really did not like this principal, honestly. I mean, she was mean. She was a mean lady. Uh, the next morning, I'm getting ready for school and our household phone rings. That was back when you just had one phone for your house, not, you know what I'm talking about. And so my dad uh, answers the phone and the principal reported to my dad and she's on the phone. She's crying. I can't believe what happened. And I just hear my dad's con uh, side of the conversation. He's like, what happened? Oh my goodness, that's terrible. I can't believe that. And he comes out and he, he says, Ryan, <laughs> do you know anything about what happened at the principal's office? And I said, no. <laughs> and he acted like he believed me to his credit he did he but I totally did it I did it and he knew I did it but it wasn't for years for years that we actually kind of you know came clean on that subject but he, he I think maybe he knew she had it coming I don't know maybe deep down <laughs> a lot of people when they think about getting judged they think about getting called to the principal's office to get in trouble for the bad things that they've done when in reality there's another type of judgment a judgment where you get called up to the podium to get rewarded for the good things that you've done. And I want to encourage you that if you will plan ahead for eternity, you don't have to fear judgment, but rather you can look forward to judgment. A lot of people plan ahead for retirement. A lot of Dave Ramsey fans in the room. And you're thinking, like, it's coming. I got to get ready, whether it's five years out or 20 years out. Hopefully you're saving for retirement. But not a lot of people plan ahead for eternity. And that's what you really need to be concerned about and focus on because eternity is forever. Every human will be judged by God. The believers and people who follow Jesus and the unbelievers, 
and the wicked. Everyone will be judged. And so you want to be ready for that day. First, let me talk about the judgment of unbelievers. What the Bible often calls and what the theologians who, who study these things call the great white throne judgment. This is the scary type. This is the one you don't want to go to. This is the one we want to avoid. This is the thing that we kind of fear when we think about judgment. But here's what the Bible says in Revelation 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them to hide, is what it means. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. In other words, people who are currently in hell are going to go stand before God in this judgment. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And, those, and who, uh, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so here's what we see, the great white throne judgment. Multiple books are open. Uh, some of the books are there to record all the deeds. There's a record of all the things that everyone has done in this life. All of their sins are right there, recorded for eternity. You might have got away with it in this life. Maybe your dad didn't catch you. Maybe the teachers didn't catch you. Maybe the police didn't catch you. But God is keeping a record, and he knows every sin that every sinner has committed. And then there is another book that's open, the book of life, where the names of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, their names are recorded, those who are being saved. And here's what I think is going to happen. The, the angels will probably be there, and they're just going to read out the list of sins when it's each person's turn to be judged. They did this, and they did this, and they did this. And there will probably even be some people there that will protest, like, but I did good things too. But the bad will far outweigh the good. And no one in hell is going to object and say they don't deserve to be there because the sins are recorded, it's locked in. And then I think what, what God's going to say is, okay, well, is his name written in the book of life? And the angel's going to check and say no. And all of those people, all those who are sinners, all those who are unbelievers, all those who rejected Jesus, the Bible says, will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the eternal hell, the eternal place of punishment for all who have lived wicked lives and rejected the Lord. The great white throne judgment is for everyone who has rejected Jesus. Now here's the good news. As a Christian, you won't experience that. Amen. Oh, oh, I was getting nervous for a second. <laughs> <laughs> right? You won't experience that. Not because you didn't do bad things, but because Jesus wiped your record clean. Because your names are written in the book of life. Christians, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. It says that in Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. So it's not because you were a good person or because you were good enough or because you chose the right church. It's because Jesus died for your sins. He wiped the record clean and he set you free. It's a gift. Thank God for salvation. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. I just receive it as a gift and I give God the praise he deserves because he's good. Amen. So what's amazing about this is we don't just get saved from our bad deeds, but through Jesus, Christians will also get rewarded for good deeds. There's another type of judgment, and Jesus expects you to do good. We're saved by grace, not by works, but grace works. Do you realize this? So let me go to the next type of judgment. This is the kind that, that I hope you will all experience the judgment seat of Christ. And it says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth, and he's talking to them about life after death. He says, for we live by faith, not by sight. In other words, we're living for something greater than that which is right in front of our faces. 
We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In other words, man, I'd rather be in heaven. So we make it our goal to please him. Look at that. I'm thinking about heaven, and so I'm making it my goal not just to get caught up in the things of this world and day to day what I got to do, but I'm living to please Jesus. I'm not just trying to get into heaven. I'm trying to actually please Jesus with my life. So here's what it says. We're trying to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking to Christians now. He's writing this letter to Christians. And he's saying we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So you as a Christian, you will be judged. You will be judged. You see this? So that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in this body, whether good or bad. So you're going to get your due. It's going to come from Jesus. I want to talk to you about the judgment seat of Christ. This is going to be a challenging sermon for some of you. This is the judgment that all believers are going to experience it. It's not getting called into the principal's office to get in trouble for the bad things you did, but it's getting called to the podium to get rewarded for the good things that you've done. It's going to be a good judgment. It's just going to be better for some than others. So I'm going to make some points here. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. Here's the first thing. All of your life will be judged by Jesus. All of your life will be judged by Jesus. Christians sometimes have a false assumption that your choices in this life will not matter in heaven. Sometimes Christians think that what they do in this life will have no effect on heaven. And that's not accurate. Now, when we get saved, it changes our status from sinner to saint. We go from being an enemy of God and we become family of God. Amen? Amen. Our sinful past gets wiped away. So the judgment seat of Christ is not a courtroom. Uh, God is not going to punish you. Jesus is not going to condemn you. It says in Romans 8, 1, there is there for now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you will not be condemned. You will not be ashamed. You will not be humiliated. Because Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sins. God isn't going to repunish you for what he already punished Jesus for on the cross. God the Father isn't going to unadopt you as his child. You're not going to lose your citizenship in heaven. So, so if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're saved. But this is to determine the reward that you will receive in heaven. Remember it says this, 2 Corinthians 5.10, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in this body, whether good or bad. So Jesus is going to judge us. That's why we don't need to judge each other. Because Jesus is going to judge us. When we think about this passage talking about, you know, we're going to be judged for the good we've done, good or bad. There's, there's another false assumption. It's that there's no crying in heaven. I think there will be some crying in heaven. There's going to be tears of joy. You're going to be like, whew, I made it. You're going to be like, man. God is so good. This place is amazing. It's so good to see Jesus. But I, I also think this, and I, I believe this, is my opinion, that before the judgment seat of Christ, there will also be tears of regret. I believe there will be tears of regret. Because in that moment, we're going to know the reality. And this is going to probably be true for each and every one of us to some extent. That, man, I could have done more. I could have done more for the Lord. I wish I would have done more. Now that I realize what was at stake and how good God is, I wish I would have done more. Now, this is not meant to be doom and gloom because it also says in Revelation 21 that Jesus, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. So I think there could be some tears of regret, but I do think there'll also be comfort from the Lord because none of us are perfect. None of us are going to get 100% on this test. We're all saved by grace. Amen? Amen. But the judgment seat of Christ will answer this question. How well did you serve your king? And you will be rewarded based on how you served him. This phrase, judgment seat of Christ, comes from the Greek word bema. The word bema is talking about the judge's seat in Olympic games. 
and this judge sat there to reward victors, not punish the losers. Amen? So you're tracking this? So it's like a performance review. You're going to get a performance review from Jesus for how well you served him in this life. The good that you've done and the times when maybe not so good. And, and the Bible makes it clear that when we come up short, there's going to be reward lost. Just like there are varying degrees of punishment in hell, there are going to be varying degrees of reward in heaven. And you're not going to get punished, right? But you, you could see people lose reward and I do think that will be a disappointing moment. Think about parents oftentimes will create a will uh, for their kids. And if there's any kind of inheritance in your will, you'll, you'll divvy it out. And maybe your parents have threatened you, like, I'm going to write you out of my will. Some of you, you're like, my kids aren't getting anything. <laughs> you know, I think about this, like, heaven is our opportunity to receive our inheritance from God. And it's going to be distributed according to our faithfulness in this life. Jesus is going to evaluate how well you served as a part of the body of Christ. Some people were lazy. They never served others. They were stingy. They were gossips. They were divisive. They were troublemakers. They sent mean emails to their pastor. And they'll lose reward. <laughs> While others who were faithful will receive great reward. And you'll be surprised some of the people who are going to get the greatest rewards will be people that didn't get a lot of esteem in this life. People that didn't get paid attention to a lot in this life, but they were faithful. And that reward will have ripple effects that goes on for eternity. Here's the second point. Your heavenly rewards are determined by your earthly good works. The word merit means conduct or actions that deserve honor, praise, or reward. When I was in the military, I experienced several promotions, and I also got some awards. What the military says is, you're promoted on potential, but you're awarded for merit. When you placed your faith in Jesus, Jesus promoted you to God's family. You have incredible potential to do great things for God. But your eternal reward is going to be based on what you actually did for God. It's based on merit. It says in Matthew 16, For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. I'm not making this up. It says this again and again throughout Scripture. Not because he owes us, but because he's generous. And he's a God of justice. He is going to reward everyone who deserves it. And your good works are going to determine what your reward looks like. So what is he measuring? That's what we really need to get down to now. We need to, know, we need to know the system. We need to understand the rules of this game if we want to win it. Here's what Jesus is measuring. He is judging your eternal impact. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.8, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You who are God's field, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. There's all this building talk here. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that was already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. That's the judgment day. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Okay, so you can kind of see there's like a difference in these building materials. Gold, silver, costly stones, things that would survive the fire. Wood, hay, and straw. Things that you could build with, but these things would not survive the fire. After the return of Christ, it actually talks about in the Bible that God's going to remake the whole world. He's going to destroy this world with fire. So this is like some metaphorical language that reflects a literal event that's going to take place. Okay, verse 14. Watch this. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. 
If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So there are some Christians, okay, I'm just, based on stats, based on numbers and the law of averages, like there are some people who are even probably going to go to Generation Church, and they're going to worship God, but they're going to build only with wood, hay, and straw. And I'm going to see you in heaven, but you're going to be there like, eyebrows singed off, (laughs) just the shirt on your back, like, I made it, but just barely. (laughs) Our master, Jesus, right, he's given us a task. He said, I'm going away. Now build my church. Build my kingdom. Make disciples. Now, here's the thing. Most everyone builds. The problem is that many put too much energy into building the wrong things and not enough energy into building the right things. So my question is, what are you building with your life? Many are going to regret only building with wood, hay, or straw. These are things that could be nice, they could be good, but they don't last. For example, there's nothing wrong with having fun, with relaxing, with playing golf, with watching Netflix, but you're not going to get rewarded based on how good your golf game is. You're not going to get rewarded based on how many series you get through on Netflix. You're not going to get rewarded for building a great wardrobe or for building a great following on social media. Those are temporary things. Wood, hay, straw. They're going to be burned up. It's not going to last. Maybe you build a great business and you get rich. But if that's it, wood, hay, and straw. Things of this world are passing away. Maybe you save and invest and you build a fortune and you pass it on to the future generations. If you don't use that wealth for God, it's actually just wood, hay, and straw. It doesn't last. Maybe you reach a a position of high influence and power, uh, an elected official, uh, a CEO. But if you don't use that influence for God, all it is, wood, hay, and straw. It's going to be burned up. It doesn't last. There's a lot of good things that you could do, but if it doesn't make an eternal impact, it's wood, hay, and straw. It doesn't last. It's possible to live the American dream. To get educated, raise a family, have a nice house, be happy, have cool stuff, but have nothing to show for it when you stand before Jesus. Those things will not last, and those believers will suffer loss, and they will lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ. In Luke 16, Jesus said, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Some of you are Christians. You are saved, but you have been untrustworthy with your worldly wealth. As a servant of Jesus Christ, with your time, with your energy, with your schedule. You haven't prioritized God in your life. You haven't put him first in your schedule, your finances, your time. You don't serve others. You don't even tell other people about Jesus. Jesus will not love you less for being untrustworthy, but he will reward you less. You just need to understand that reality. And I'm telling you this not to beat you up, but because I love you and I want to help you up so you can do better. Because there's still time. If you got breath in your lungs, you got an opportunity to do something for Jesus. We don't want to be safe but lose eternal reward. And the Lord has made the rules clear. Anyone can participate in this, rich or poor, great or small. It's not about how much you give. It's about how generous you are with what you have to work with. It's not about what specific task you do. It's about how faithful you are with the gifts and skills and opportunities that God has given you to use for him. What are you building? Is it going to fade away or is it built to last? Is your work built to last? Are you building with gold, silver, and precious stones, things that would survive the refiner's fire? These are the good works that have an eternal impact. Let me explain that. What do you mean have an eternal impact? Well, what lasts for eternity? God and the human soul. So let me explain. What works have an eternal impact? It's when you save souls for Jesus 
and when you do anything that honors and glorifies our eternal God. That's what has an eternal impact. That's building with gold, silver, and precious stones. So we want to see souls saved. We want to make disciples. We want to honor God by obeying his commands. We build with all kinds of resources that God has given us, like our words, like speaking life to people, telling people about Jesus, spreading the gospel, um, using your energy and your time to serve others, to serve the Lord. Using your finances to give and build the kingdom of God. Giving to your local church. Building Jesus' church. Making disciples. Like showing someone else how to like understand the Bible. Helping poor people. The widow and the orphan. Those are works that have eternal impact. That's building with precious stones, gold and silver. So it could look different for you based on what God has given you. You could be a stay-at-home mom and yet you could be building with gold, silver and precious stones. If you're raising up kids and you're teaching them about Jesus and you're prioritizing bringing them to church and showing them how to live for the Lord, that's gold, silver, precious stone stuff right there. You could be a dad who leads his family to the Lord, who leads his family in the process of serving the Lord. You put church first, right? You don't just stop going to church when football comes on. You keep going, right? Like you lead your family in this. And you know, like, if dad serves the Lord, the family is 97% likely to be saved and also serve the Lord. A lot of the stuff that doesn't get a lot of applause is going to be actually gold, silver, and precious stone stuff. Man, like the people on stage on Sunday get a lot of applause. But also the people changing diapers in the nursery. That's gold, silver, and precious stones right there. The person who mentors other Christians to grow in their faith, maybe leads a life group, serves others. That's building with the things that last. The person, watch, in the secular world, right, outside of church, you could work hard at your job. You could build a business and then faithfully use the profits, not just to enrich yourself, but to build the kingdom of God. That's investing in eternity, and that investment always gets an incredible return. Using your finances to reach more people with the gospel. Um, I, mean, I even think about this. A lot of people, like when you think about creating a will and, and a last will and testament for your, for your kids, maybe giving them an inheritance. Like my goal as a dad is to leave some kind of inheritance to my kids, but also give a percentage of what I have to my church. So that what I did in this life will keep impacting eternity even after I go into eternity. Amen? I'm just kind of hedging my bets there. <laughs> See, all your good deeds are going to be recognized and rewarded, not just by a pastor. Who cares what a pastor thinks? But by Jesus. And there will be an a, a incredible award ceremony. It's not even just what we do, but it's how we do it and why we do it. Your attitude also matters. Were you doing good things? But needing to get recognition and applause from people all along the way? Because let's be honest, there's some of those people. Did you all see what I did? I'm pretty sure you did, because I posted about it. <laughs> Wasn't that great? Wasn't that great? Pretty great, right? And, and what the Lord says is, you can do that, but you've already received your reward. But the person that says, man, I'm just going to labor for the Lord in private, sometimes in secret, Sometimes I'll get appreciation, but other times no one will even know about it. But Jesus knows about it, and he will reward you for it. Your attitude, and also, these things are relative. So, man, there are some people who, who giving $20 might be more generous than someone else who gives $10,000. You, you could be poor, and like the widow who gave her last two coins, and then you could have another guy who's pouring gold in the treasure chest, right? And Jesus say, man, this widow gave more than this rich guy who gave so much because she was more generous with what she had to work with. The Lord is so just in this. And what I want just as your pastor is for your day at the judgment seat of Christ to be an amazing day. I don't think any of us are going to get awarded for being perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. But... I want it to be a great day. It says in Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work 
and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So there are some of you who have done things for the Lord and no one has ever thanked you for it. None of your kids maybe recognize how much you sacrificed for them. Maybe even the people at church just didn't know what you did to thank you for it. But I just wanted you to be encouraged that you will be recognized. And honestly, we spend too much time concerning ourselves with getting recognition and appreciation in this life. And we don't spend enough time thinking about the recognition and reward that's going to come in the next life. Because that's what's really going to matter. So if you think nobody sees, the Lord sees. In 1 Corinthians 15, 41, it says this. This is interesting. The sun has one kind of splendor and the moon another and the stars another. And stars differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. What's this talking about? The sun is brighter than the moon and the stars have a different kind of brightness. And what this is saying is that the resurrection of the dead in eternity, some people are going to shine brighter than others. I don't know if that means like literally, but we're going to see that there are some people who did more for Jesus in this life than other people. And they're going to receive their reward. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to come before Jesus empty handed. I know he's not going to love me more for serving him faithfully. He couldn't love me more than he already does. Couldn't love you more than he already does. But he will reward us more for serving him faithfully. So here's the third point. This is the last point. Let the promise of future rewards motivate you to please God today. Let the promise of future rewards motivate you to please God today. There's this other misconception in Christianity like, well, you shouldn't care about rewards. You should just do it for the love of God. And you should do it for the love of God. But if Jesus didn't want you to know about reward day, he wouldn't have told you about reward day. Yeah. Over, there's this thing about human nature. We tend to have this question, what's in it for me? No one's telling LeBron James he should play basketball just for the love of the game. They're like, get paid, bro. And the Lord is telling you, I'm not asking you to serve even just because you love me, although he would be justified if he did. But he's also saying there is a lot in it for you. There's a lot at stake here. And man, he tells us again and again in Matthew 6, 19. Look what he says. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven did you ever notice this it says yourselves store up for yourselves think about yourself think about your eternity and what's in your best interest in eternity it's not just for god that you're giving tithes and offerings but man you're storing up treasure for yourself in heaven like i hope i heard one pastor tell this story a long time ago about a guy he died and he went to heaven and jesus was like come on i'm going to show you your mansion and he's like, all right, let's go. I've been waiting for this moment. And he comes around the corner, and there's like a real cute little shack with like a little chimney and some smoke coming up. And like there were some flowers in the front yard and a little picket fence. And it was real nice, but, but, real, but real small, cozy like. And he looked around, and he saw like, man, there's like a big old mansion over there. There's like a castle there. And he's like, Jesus, uh, why, why is my place, you know, it's, it's nice, but why is it so small? And Jesus said, well, I did the best I could with what you sent ahead. <laughs> okay, but for real, that's kind of a silly, cheesy story. But for real, it's actually not a bad reflection of what eternity is going to be like. Like, you're not going to be sad to be there no matter what, whether you're in like a cozy little cabin or in a mansion, but it's gonna be better for some than others. I wanna go from being nearsighted to more farsighted. Like when I was in the military, I got laser eye surgery, thanks to taxpayers, and uh, <laughs> made it so I didn't have to wear contacts and glasses all the time, because before that, you know, I could only really see clearly what was right in my own hand at arm's length. Beyond that, things were very blurry. You know, I was thinking about how so many of us were so nearsighted about our lives and what we're doing with our time and with our money 
and our priorities, and we just kind of see what's right in front of our face, and then we don't really think about what's ahead, let alone an eternity. I want to be responsible with what I have in my hands today in a way that it'll impact eternity and what I face forever, what I experience forever, the reward that we'll enjoy forever. See, a lot of times we have this misconception like, well, you know, if I give God these dollars, then I'll have less dollars. Or, you know, if I serve Jesus with this hour, I'll have less hours. But that's not the way it works. Every dollar, every hour you invest into the kingdom of God is a finite resource that will be enjoyed eternally in heaven. It'll impact forever. You'll be enjoying that reward forever. I mean, I think about how funny it is. So many people, they look back and they say, I wish I would have invested in Amazon in 2007. Oh, man. Or now, now people are like, I wish I would have bought Bitcoin in 2012. Like, it's easy to look back in hindsight and say, that would have been so smart. But you want to be one of the people that in the moment takes advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven saying, I wish I would have done more for God. But man, you want to be one of those people that said, I did. Use what he gave me to the best of my ability. And I'm saved by grace, but I'm glad that I made the most of my opportunity. In Luke 14, it says, you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And Jesus said in Revelation 22, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So my question to you is, what do you want your judgment day to look like? What do you want your judgment day to look like? First off, you don't want to be at the great white throne judgment. That's like number one. You got to get that out of the way. I don't want you to stand before the great white throne judgment and get uh, all your sins read out and have to account for it and then realize you can't and face eternity in the lake of fire. That's pretty bad. Nobody needs to experience that. So the first thing you got to take care of is accept Jesus. Accept Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Let him come into your life and forgive your sins and wipe them clean. And have your name written in the book of life so that you don't have to pay the price for your sins. Jesus already died on the cross. And if you accept him, the penalty you deserve will be counted in the death of Jesus on the cross. So you won't have to face that kind of judgment. Then there's another type of judgment, right? The judgment seat of Christ. Where all of God's people are going to be rewarded for the good they've done in this life. What do you want that day to look like? Do you want to be the guy that gets into heaven with his eyebrows singed off? (laughs) At least I made it. Or do you want to be someone who is, man, I'm so glad that I have so much to show for my life. I I don't want any of you to stand before the Lord empty-handed and experience even an ounce of regret. This is a challenging sermon. I know that. So... I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you to receive it in love and process it in the right way. And what I pray for you is that you'll make the most of every minute from this day forward. Think about eternity and what's at stake. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for salvation and that we don't have to face the punishment that we did deserve. We get to receive the inheritance that you deserve. We thank you for your love and your favor, God. I thank you that your love and your favor and our status as your children, it's not based on what we do. But Lord, we do recognize today that there is a reward that is based on what we do. And we're grateful to you that you laid that out for us so clearly in your word. So that now we can do something about it. We can live as faithful servants who hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I thank you today, Lord, for the person who needed a shift in their perspective from what's right in their hand today to how their impact will ripple out through eternity. We want to live for eternity. We thank you, God, for being with us right now. But help us to live for eternity 
and make the most of our lives. I want to just take a minute. If you're here and you need to accept Jesus, pray this with me right now. Just say, Lord, I ask you to save me. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for my sins so that I could be set free and redeemed. And I believe that you rose again so I could experience eternal life and live forever in eternity in heaven with you. I want to live for you now the rest of my days in Jesus' name. And with our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed, if you're a Christian, I want to pray for you right now. God, I pray for your people that within all of us, you will stir up a passion to live for you and to make the most of every opportunity. We pray, God, that what we do in this life will have a ripple effect on eternity. We pray this and believe for it in Jesus' name. Amen.